Thank you for such a warm welcome. Um, I'm actually quite excited to be in a community of fellow peace builders. Um, I have to tell you, it feels a little bit lonely when I'm in Silicon Valley doing what I do. Um, but I'm thrilled to be here, and we're going to, I'm going to kind of uh, give you an overview of what we do and uh, what we need to do in terms of technology. So first of all, I am, not from, I am from Silicon Valley, but I'm not here to save the world. I want to make that very, very clear. Um, often in Silicon Valley, um, we attract a, a lot of idealistic people, certainly at Stanford, and they all have been raised because they're the best and the brightest, and they've all been given the message, you have so much potential, you need to go and do something that's gonna have a huge impact in the world, right? So part of it is just the programming that these young people get. They come in and they wanna do something that is gonna be earth shattering. Now, what happens sometimes is they actually shatter the earth, and it doesn't work out so well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. But first, let's see, I'm going to queue up my PowerPoint, which is here somewhere. I think I might need some technical assist to find the file. Sorry, Kate. So um, my background is in technology. As you can tell, I'm not an academic. I just impersonate one in my day life. Um, so I have great respect for all of you who are genuine, full doctors. I am not, so I will disabuse you of that notion. Please don't call me Dr. Kiwis. I'm not a doctor. Um, however, what I am is a practitioner and what I do is I translate research for practitioners. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the Peace Innovation Lab. So BJ Fogg is our mentor. Um, this wouldn't have gotten off the ground without him. In 2007, he said, I think that it's possible to create world peace. And what happened in 2007 was there was this class, which was the famous Facebook class of Stanford in 2007, um, students got together, and in 10 weeks, they built these apps because Facebook opened up its platform for third-party developers. And what those students did is they started making millions of dollars in a 10-week class. At the end of six months, they had made something like $30 million, and it was crazy. Uh, the final for that class, there were 500 people in the room because everyone, the rumors, the word had gotten around in Silicon Valley that these kids had figured something out. And what they had figured out was mass interpersonal persuasion. Because for the first time, individuals could influence the behavior of millions of people and get them to do things. Now, I don't know how many of you remember Facebook 10 years ago, but back then, you could send, you could poke people and send zombie kisses and do very, very silly little things, right? But what happened was it was a convergence of the ability to, to write these tiny little apps and also analytics. So for the first time, you could actually see what was happening because it was all digital. So there was a behavior trail. And that was revolutionary, OK? So when that happened, BJ said, oh, OK, if this is possible, what else is possible behaviorally through technology? And note that BJ uh, founded the field of persuasive technology in the 1990s at Stanford. And the notion was that technology in the future would be a mediating social actor. And this was back when we still had Palm Pilots and we had AOL. And they were saying, like, wow, technology is actually going to be influencing how we interact with each other and how we interact with the technology. Fast forward. And, and that was, it was a notion. And people go, like, uh-huh, don't really get it. And then the iPhone came out. And all of a sudden, people were glued to their iPhone. And all of a sudden, the notifications and nudges that you were getting from your iPhone and from wearables became apparent that these technologies could actually shape our behavior, uh, trigger us to do the behavior, and then record the fact that we did the behavior. So that is the context and the, the basically the intellectual basis from our work. And. Uh, you know, now that we have this mass interpersonal persuasion, uh, we have all these sensors everywhere. We have them in our pocket with our phone. We have them in the Internet of Things. We have them in webcams everywhere. So we have this, this way to detect behavior constantly, as you know, 
in so, you know, the dark side, it could feel like a surveillance society. On the other hand, it gives us more knowledge of what people actually do. It gives us more knowledge of how the environment works, right? It's not opinion anymore. It's like now we have real data. We can see what's going on. What we've done is we started to look at how you can systematically design behavior at scale using these technologies. Um, the new field that BJ is working now is called behavior design. And um, so our work sits at the intersection of behavior design, persuasive tech, and also business. Because in Silicon Valley, everything's driven by a business model. So how do you use behavior with technology, with a business model to affect change? For us, we're interested in this because we need to figure out how to make sustainable peace. Otherwise, we're perpetually in the nonprofit world of struggling to raise money, and that's not sustainable. And so we want to figure out how to incentivize good behavior, positive peace behavior, um, that has some sort of underlying business model within it. So after nine years of wandering around in the wilderness, figuring out what we're not, because when you're starting a new field, the first thing you need to do is figure out, OK, we don't do this, we don't do that, we don't do that. Now, Hoda, this is the latest. We figured out these are the three things that we're working on. One is we want to catalyze a peace tech industry. right? And so we've spent the last nine years looking at weak signals of how technology could be used to create positive peace. The next thing is, as you know, technology has moved fast and broken a lot of things. So we need to create frameworks and curriculum in the safe and ethical deployment of any kind of emerging technology. And third, we're working to establish a market signal for the value of peace. And we've done this through um, the peace data standard that we just published in March. So I'm going to tell you some stories about all this stuff. And here you can see our toolkit. It's around behavior design, persuasive tech, and also peace data. This is what we look at. So first of all, and the other thing that we look at, the thing that we really care about is any kind of mediating technology that comes between two people with different identities, some sort of a difference boundary. This is really key. Um, and if I could get all of you to sit closer to each other and sit next to someone you don't know. Are you guys sitting next to someone you don't know? Pretty much? OK, I want you to take the next minute and think about all your identities, all your roles. You might be a parent, you might be an academic, you might be from DC or Maryland or from the South or whatever, and just mentally, or just write it down, just a list of things for about a minute. And I will, I will time this. All your social identities. So have you got a decent list yet? Do you need more time? Raise your hand if you need more time. OK. So now what I want you to do is with the person next to you, and if you're not sitting next to someone, sit next to someone, compare your lists. So did, did you find things that you have in common? And if so, raise your hand. OK, did you find things that you didn't have in common? And if so, raise your hand. OK, very good. So I want you to hold that thought in terms of these difference boundaries that you just bridged, right? And one of the things that, and, and the, the time that we live in, in terms of identity, um, especially in the polarized society that we live in. Um, you know, identity is variable, right? Um, and so one of the, the tricks is how do you get the salient identity to pop up, right? Is it a political identity that matters? Is it that you both share a love of the same baseball team? Or that, you know, you both buy the same books on Amazon? These identities are manipulated constantly with technology. 
And as we collect data about you, we know a lot about all these different group identities. And obviously, uh, platforms like Amazon are able to micro-target. You know, say so like you, are, my co-director, is in the community of people who loves vintage 1920s airplanes from Czechoslovakia, right? And so a marketer could say, I'm going to, you know, target you. On the other hand, you could be targeted for your political affiliation, right? And so these things are constantly being manipulated. Within our lab, what we care about is figuring out how good can we be to each other? Because at heart, we are, you know, and this is great that, um, you know, that you're in the School of Behavioral Sciences, because we're interested, how do we unpack peace um, from saying, okay, we want to go do positive peace, but then on Monday morning, nobody knows how to operationalize that. It's like, okay, Hoda, on Monday, I want you to start making positive peace in the world. And you're going to go, I don't know what to do. Instead, what we say is, I want you to smile at someone. I want you to greet someone by name. I want you to open the door for someone whose hands are full. Those are tiny, discrete behaviors that we can do that demonstrate how good we can be to someone else. So when we think about positive peace in our lab, we're trying to elicit these tiny behaviors consistently and at scale. So let's talk a little bit about peace tech. And this is a, a shot from a, a video game. I'm going to tell you a story about besties. So besties. What are besties? Our BFFs. We all have a BFF, right? So in 2009, we did a project called Peace Dot. And in 2009, we wanted to measure. We wanted to see, could you measure peace in some way? And so we went to all these companies and say, show us how you're creating peace in the world. And Facebook was our flagship partner. And what they did was they looked at the friending data across difference boundaries. And they, for a number of years, they tracked the unique new friendships between people across a difference boundary. And in this case, they looked at Palestinians and Israelis. They looked at Pakistanis and Indians, Democrats and Republicans. It was a very different era back in 2009. Christians and Muslims and so on. And you could see for the first time the amount of positive engagement that was going on between these communities. Now, if you just read the news, you would think no Palestinian ever would ever make friends with any Israeli ever, right? Because we read the news, and obviously they hate each other, and they're bombing each other, and they just want to exterminate each other. But what we saw in Facebook, well, that was not necessarily the case. There were people who self-identified as Israeli and self-identified as Palestinians, and they were making friends with each other. And so that was our first instance where we could actually begin to measure this. Further, we looked at this and we looked at the, we tracked the daily friendships. And what was interesting that was that in 2012, you had the Operation Pillar Defense. So, okay, they're, they're lobbing rockets at each other, right? And you think, okay, there should be no friending going on whatsoever. But even with that, people were still making friendships across that difference boundary. And we could detect that. So this is this notion for the first time we actually, Facebook actually instrumented society. And we could see what was going on. And if you wanted to go further, you could probably you know, do some data mining to see what was the level of interaction, what was the frequency of interaction, and so on. And um, I was working with uh, Ronnie Edry at the time. And he, start, he launched a citizen diplomacy campaign called Israel Loves Iran. And you know, just use Facebook as the, as the platform to do this. And I had the opportunity to be the page administrator. He gave me page administration rights. So I could look at the daily engagement data that was going on between not only Palestinian, or Israelis and Iranians, but Israelis and everybody else. And you could see it based on gender, based on age, based on you know, what city they were in. Uh, the time of day, and so on. So now you have this really, like, imagine like, uh, like the Hadron, uh, you know, it's sort of like you, you've got the Hubble telescope of social, right? You could see everything. And the platform allowed us to do that. My next story is called Strangers in the Night. So if I had asked you 20 years ago, you know, hold up, um, uh, would you allow a perfect stranger into your home? someone you've never met, 
would you let them spend the night with you? How many, would you say, how many of you 20 years ago would have said yes? Really? Oh, good for you. Most of you say like, no. Now, what if I, said, what if I offer you, what if I pay you 100 bucks? Will you let a perfect stranger into your home? Right? What if I paid you 200 bucks? And you say like, no. You know, what is it worth? If I wanted to say, you know, in a religion, we, we have things about hospitality. How do we treat strangers, right? But that doesn't scale because like, okay, my religion says that, but do I actually practice this? What would it be worth if you could get people to open their homes up for a night? You know, could you put an economic value on it? And more on top of that, not only are you going to let them into your home, you're going to be nice to them. You know, the place is going to be clean, you're going to have coffee, there's going to be flowers. You're going to make it a nice experience for them. Would you do that? Would you put yourself out to do that? I don't know. And then, of course, you need to be considerate. Because at the end of it, they're going to say, well, what was that like? Oh, yeah, you know, Hoda treated me really, really well. She smiled and she greeted me and so on and so forth, right? And if you could do this at scale, if you get millions of people to do this at scale, what would that be like? Well, of course, you all know the answer. This is Airbnb. Airbnb is one of the largest citizen diplomacy projects in the world. And what's interesting about Airbnb is that you know, we, we did this class a few years ago about designing trust at scale. And we, we really dug into Airbnb because they had gotten millions of perfect strangers to be willing to interact with each other. And they solved this problem through this platform because they addressed the issues of trust, safety, and security. Now, is it 100%? No, by no means. But they got over this threshold where people were willing to engage in, in this behavior, not once, but repeatedly. And because it has an underlying business model, people are willing to do it again and again and again, right? And what's more interesting to me, because I'm female, is that women hosts are the super hosts on Airbnb. Women who we are so sensitive to safety and security and letting weird people into our home, they're making bank on this. So Airbnb has done all the filtering we're through reputation systems and algorithms so that we feel confident that we can engage in this behavior with a stranger, right? It's pretty powerful. So this is a case where you can get positive engagement at scale, sustainable. They do it in 191 countries, 640,000 hosts. I met with the director of diversity a year ago uh, talking about the implicit bias because they found that there was implicit bias on the platform. They looked at the behavior data and they said, you know what, our critics are right. We actually can see it. And so what they did was said, okay, we're going to figure out how to solve this problem. We're looking, what is the behavior that we want to see with our guests and hosts? What is the behavior we don't want to see? How do we correct that? And so they made adjustments to the platform to reduce bias so people could, could get a, um, you know, an accommodation if they needed it. But they also are working on rolling out anti-bias training to all their hosts worldwide. Now, when you think about this, if they are successful, and this is hard. I do not trivialize the task at all. But if they are even successful at improving it by 10%, they will have touched behaviors in 191 countries. And if we think about civil rights legislation, if we think about what we can do locally and what a global platform like this can do all over the world, the impact is potentially huge. And so I, I am hopeful. My next story is Play Nice. Now, I uh, and Chris Bennett uh, run the Game Design Thinking Research Group here. And I know there's someone who does game design here who's going to speak on the panel later. Um, we've been looking at video game platforms uh, because, as he says, they sit at the tip of the spear. And one of the things that's happening with video games, as you probably know, is there's a lot of toxicity. Gamergate, lots of bad behavior that happens on platforms. In fact, Riot Games, which does League of Legends, is typically number one in the worst toxic community platforms for video games. But what was interesting is that Dr. Jeff Lynn there said, should we do something about it? Is it our problem? Or should we just let the game players just be awful to each other, right? And he said, well, actually, we need to do something about this. And so 
he and 40 other psychologists got to work on the platform and started testing and looking at interventions to reduce toxicity on that platform. And they did you know, every psych trick in the book, priming, they changed the color of, of, of text, they nudged people, they punished people, they created tribunals, they provided feedback. Because their initial hypothesis was, I know what we'll do, we'll just get rid of all the assholes on the platform, pardon my French, but that's what they said. And say, well, just get rid of all the bad players, you know, all the bad guys. Well, that was about 2%. When they looked at the data, it turned out that everybody was being a jerk. But the reason they were being a jerk was statistically somebody was having a bad day. And so if you were gonna ban all the bad actors, there would be no video players, video game players. And that wasn't practical. Instead, what they started doing was started reflecting back the behavior of the players to the players. So many of these guys did not have that level of self-awareness. They did not know that they were coming off this way. And so they would just reflect back the chat and say, well, you know, you said this really toxic, racist, hateful stuff. Oh, I'm not that kind of guy. Really? Well, let's roll back the tape. And they're going like, oh my god, I am that way. What was fascinating about this was because it has such a large N, and for anyone who's ever done a psych department experiment where you hope to get 20 people, 20 subjects, to see if you can get, see an effect, on Riot Games, they had millions of players. And because they had millions of players, they could, in one, one control, they were able to test 216 different conditions. It's kind of crazy in terms of the scale of testing for behavior that you can do on these platforms. But they were able to make a dent on it. And you could see, again, it's a very systematic engineering approach around behavior. How do we get people to, to be better to each other? How can we reduce the negativity? You know, and so on and so forth. And they started putting these things together and getting data back. Ultimately, this year at the Game Developers Conference, a new organization was formed called the Fair Play Alliance. So these are 30 video game companies who have come together to share practices, research, and know-how on how to improve online game communities. Now, these are the worst of the worst, right? And so, but they are acknowledging that they need to do something about this. And the reason they see that they need to do something about this is that if they don't, people won't want to play games anymore. And so this is a case where good behavior is aligned with the business model. Just as with Airbnb, they saw that they had to deal with bias because if people felt that it wasn't a safe place to go on, they weren't going to go there anymore. And other people might say, well, I don't want to participate in that platform either because I don't want to run into that situation. Okay. So the next thing that we focus on is designing safe and ethical technologies. And let me tell you something about this slide. So I was on Getty Images last night looking for, for appropriate photos and things. I could not find a single photo or image on ethical design or technology. Now, I understand that it's very hard to represent visually, but I thought that was telling. So in this day and age, any technology, any technology, doesn't matter what it is, can and will be weaponized. So I say this as an old woman from Silicon Valley to the young men in Silicon Valley, your technology is going to be gamed and it's going to be weaponized. And it's going to be done in a way that you did not intend or that you did not foresee. One of the, um, you know, if I could go in the Wayback Machine and go back to Twitter and say, okay, you think it would be great for people to be able to say anything they want. Okay, you're a young guy, so you want to be able to say anything you want. Awesome, right? Except what happens when people actually start saying anything they want? What do we do then? And typically in Silicon Valley, for these young innovators, their attitude has been, that's somebody else's problem. The other dilemma in engineering is, and I say this as someone who has a degree in engineering, is that the tradition in engineering is that we build things and we make things. There's bills of materials, you know, we understand stresses, we understand you know, the failure of metal, all these things. We are not taught how to engineer societies. We don't know anything about that. We're totally stupid about that. And so what's happened in the last 10, 15 years is that technology innovation isn't about 
making a better airplane. It's about uh, coming in and mediating how people work together. And if you don't understand human nature and human behavior, you're going to unleash all sorts of forces, as we have seen. So uh, one of the areas that we're very focused on is how to deploy and, and put together curriculum around responsible technology design. Because as we know, we have sensors everywhere in, in the environment. So I was at a talk um, earlier this spring, so I'm going to plagiarize a moment, but I'm telling you that. Um, the speaker was talking about this famous chemist in the early 20th century, and he was revered because he had come up with a solution um, in terms of a new mixture of gasoline. And because it was an issue with the engines and they knocked a lot and so on and so forth, and so he said, I know, I have a great, I have a great intervention. I'm gonna put lead in the gasoline. And it solved this problem with the engine. The, and it was brilliant and he was celebrated and got a cover of Time Magazine, it was awesome, great guy. The only problem was there was lead in the gasoline. And there was no way to detect the effect of lead in the environment, much less human health. And by the time, decades later, the people said, hmm, I think there might be a problem with lead in the environment. There was quite a bit of debate for another 20, 30 years as to what to do about it. But it went on for 50 years because we had no way to, to easily detect levels of lead. Today in this day and age, with Internet of Things, with sensors everywhere, we can detect things as they're happening. So we don't have the excuse anymore of, well, I didn't know. And so one of the challenges that we need to do and the mindset that we need to change with innovators is to get them to proactively look for negative side effects of any technology they deploy, just as we do with new drugs. So imagine if you, do, if you could do clinical trials on software and say, okay, if I put this out there, am I getting the intended effect that I want, but am I getting any bad side effects? And if so, what's my intervention? How do I fix that? Because if the, if the cost is greater than the benefit, maybe we shouldn't do that. And these are the kinds of ethical conversations we need to start having in innovation. Um, the last thing I want to do is, you know, with AI and machine learning, as you probably, I don't know, how many of you saw the story about Amazon and their AI for recruiting, right? And basically, it was systematically um, discriminating against women. Why? Because the AI data set was looking at, well, what does success look like, right? Um, with AI, with machine learning, with any of this, we need to, the non-technologists need to be in the room and say, wait a minute, are we, are we modeling the best of human behavior? Are we just perpetuating what's already there? So um, how many of you use Slack? Do you use Slack? Okay, Slack is a very big thing in, in the Valley. We all use Slack. And um, the CEO of Slack was wondering if Slack was perpetuating things like mansplaining. Because you're going like, what if our platform merely takes the, the, the implicit bias, all the things that shut down women and people of color in real life, are we unintentionally perpetuating this on our platform? And if so, how would we detect that? And if so, how would we change the platform so we would get the kind of dialogue that we actually want? It was a provocative question. I give him kudos for actually thinking about it. And so he's looking at this from the sense of personal analytics. In Silicon Valley, we have a terrible problem with gender. We have a terrible problem with diversity. But you can't have the conversation because people put up, you know, the shields go up. They don't want to be shamed. They don't want to be blamed. And quite honestly, shaming and blaming has never been an effective um, tool for behavior change. You shut people down and they avoid you, but you don't actually work on the problem. But if you could flip it around and say, you know what? Your goal is, here's your communications dashboard, how are you doing? You know, my goal is to be able to get back to people within 36 hours. And you had analytics that said, you know what, you do pretty good with your best bros, but you do really bad with people across another department. You're like, oh, now I have data. Now I have a metric. It's like getting your 10,000 steps. I need to get back to people within 36 hours. Oh, I do terribly with women. Okay, now I have an objective measure. I know what to do and I have, I have a goal that I can meet. It's very, it's very uh, 
tactical. I'm curious to see if this will be effective in moving the needle in terms of behavior in the enterprise. When we think about um, you know, where we spend most of our time when we're not sleeping and at home with family watching Netflix, we're at work. And so how do we bring digital peace into the workplace? Because that's where we mostly feel it. The last thing we're focused on is creating a market signal for the value of peace. Now again, we're very interested in how you do that across a difference boundary. Um, and one of the things that my co-director, Mark Nelson, he was a former investment banker, he would say, Margarita, there is a, um, a structural problem with addressing peace. If you look at the capital markets, they have this much money. If you look at foundations and philanthropy, they have this much money. And if you look at NGOs, they have this much money. You know, a corporation, just in its normal operation, can do all this harm, and then the C their CSR department is trying to undo it with pennies on the dollar. You're, it's just never, ever going to work. What we need to do is fundamentally change how companies operate, and we need to reward their ability to create more peace in the world. But we need to do it in a way that is part and parcel of how they do business. So we worked on this for a number of years and said, OK, what we need to do is come up with a data standard. If we can come up with a, an agreed upon framework uh, that companies could use to objectively measure the positive piece that they're creating in the world, where we're looking at what the interaction is across a difference boundary. So we did this study with an Australian bank. Hey, hello, Australia. And we looked at their communications platform looking at gender as the difference boundary. And we wanted to see what the interaction was between men and women. And, and luckily, in this, um, this financial institution, they have branches all over Australia, their workforce is roughly 50-50 male, female. So it was a really good data set. And we started examining what the interactions were, what the social networks were, and so on. And it gave us an opportunity to really start thinking about how do you measure those discrete episodes of engagement. And then the next level up from that is how would you value that? Could you, put, could you assign a monetary value? And so this is sort of an example of piece data format. And again, we're looking at you know, who are the senders, their group identity. In this case, we, ca we cared about gender. It could have been something else. It could have been department. It could have been age. It could have been ethnicity. Um, what is the mediating technology, and what's going on between them. And um, we uh, have established the standard, and now we're going out to other companies to see if they will work on, with us to create case studies uh, to do this. We're working with um, a major enterprise software company who wants to build a gender tool in their HR platform that complies with uh, the SDG 5 around gender. Right. So all of a sudden, you know, for companies who are struggling to, to comply with SDGs or companies who want to show that um, they are ESG index compliant, how many of you are familiar with ESG indices? This is environmental, societal, governance. A lot of uh, investors, when we talk to pension funds, family offices, um, entities that want to invest in companies that are going to have some sort of impact, they struggle to find deal flow. They struggle to find companies that they can invest in because the definition is so squishy. By having a data standard that can be audited by a third party like an Ernst & Young, then they can be able to objectively measure these companies and compare them and see what their um, impact is. So, so here's my open invitation to you, is that for all of you to help us build a more robust standard in terms of case studies, collaboration, and so on. And normally, Mark, my uh, co-director, gives this piece of the talk. He's talking to companies and corporate CXOs. He says, you know, everybody has peace data. They just don't know it. And by using this peace data standard, you can begin to surface the positive engagement that you're creating in the world. And OK, for businesses, it's always, well, what's in it for me? Why should I do this? And we can say, money, of course. Why? Uh, because we believe that businesses can do more for peace than anybody else. They touch so many people. They touch us in our everyday lives. Supply chains, employment, um, how they interact with resources in the environment. If, you know, for us, positive engagement is positive peace. 
and what we're looking to do is how can we get companies to work effectively across these boundaries. Ultimately, what we see in this is basically creating the equivalent of carbon credits for peace to incentivize companies to do this. And you can look at an Airbnb. They're already incentivized to create positive engagement because it's part and parcel of their business model. As we get into companies that rely on networks of people to interact with each other, it is in their business self-interest to make sure that people are good to each other. And so I am, I am hopeful that we can have an impact there. I'm minding the time here. Um, I am hopeful for this, but it requires new frameworks. It requires um, new models, and it also requires participation from non-engineers. One of the dilemmas in engineering is that it becomes an echo chamber of engineers talking to each other, right? I and, and Silicon Valley and Stanford is certainly guilty of this. We have all these young, bright minds who want to have an impact in the world, and so what we end up is perpetuating a form of colonial innovation, where we come in and say, I know your problem, I've observed you, and I've, I've done need finding of you, and here's my solution for you, rather than, and rather than people coming up with their own solutions. In our lab, our philosophy is we're, we're just, you know, we have a skill set, but we're not prescriptive. It's up to communities to come up with their own solutions, and it may or may not involve tech. Tech is, should be in the service of humanity, it shouldn't be leading what, you know. I often hear, and I push back, because I'm the old lady in Silicon Valley. They go, Margarita, you know what? It's going to be robotics and AI, and, and you know, jobs are going to go away and just get used to it. How many of you say hell yes to that future? It's like, I can't wait to be unemployed and for the robots to take over everything. How many of you say, like, yes, that is in 20 years' time when I wake up, and I open my eyes and I look around, that's the world that I want for myself, my children, and my grandchildren. I rarely have anyone say, yes, that's what I want. And yet the future is always our choice. We get to design it. And I know from being a venture capitalist, there are many people who had great ideas, but you know what? So many of those ideas died because either people didn't want them, there was no interest in it, or just simply didn't get funded. If we want to create a particular kind of future, we need to fund it. You know, we need to have, I was at a conference earlier at Stanford where they're talking about disintermediating all these things in cities and all that, and I go, who's missing in the room? Where are the labor unions? Where are the advocacy groups? Because they should be writing a check to these researchers at Stanford saying, I want you to come up with business models where robot, you know, robots augment human labor not replace human labor. I want you to come up and teach a class on how we could use AI to you know, create stable employment for people so they could have, uh, we could have a middle class again. Those sorts of innovations don't happen and that research doesn't happen because no one's funding it. If we want to change the direction of technology and technology innovation, we need to have different people writing those checks and setting those research agendas. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop there. I got way too many slides. I've talked way too long, but thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very informative, very interesting. Uh, why don't we have some questions and there's a microphone in the middle here. If you could just uh, line up and uh, ask your question, and I really would like to emphasize to ask the question rather than um, go on about other things. Okay, so whoever would like, please go to the microphone. Please. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure you don't miss a session of Freakonomics. <laughs> um, I, I was. I was listening to what you were saying about, um, this leads to my question, what you were saying about uh, Facebook and what we've learned. And at the same time, I watch very closely what the government is, of China is doing in the same area of um, social behavioral change through scoring individuals throughout the country, and they're up into the millions of people now in their database. Um, 
So the question, uh, you know, jumped out at me. Um, uh, you know, people will say, oh, well, that sounds great. Facebook is telling me a lot. But they're terrified of China telling them a lot. Yeah. And so it really gets back to the source, which gets back to the ethics. And, and, and when you said all things can be weaponized, just this last couple weeks, the concept occurred to me that, you know, I try to smile and I try to start these chains of, of you know, peace or love, whatever. And, um, and it dawned on me that, that uh, it's a form of weaponizing love. And, I, it, it, you know, because we're weaponizing everything to accomplish a goal. Mm -hmm. So this whole concept of weaponizing um, and what you were saying, suddenly it jumped out at the very end talking about, about business having that effect. And I thought carbon credits and peace credits all of a sudden. So my question really is, what are your suggestions for maintaining some sort of ethical standards mm -hmm. because we're going into a huge area where it could do everything in either direction. Absolutely. So um, I'm on the executive committee for the Peace Engineering Conference that's coming up in a few weeks at the University of New Mexico. Uh, it's WEF and GEEC, the uh, two engineering societies, so it's going to be all the engineering deans and so on. And we're actually going to talk about this for the first time at a conference, talking about because not only is there like a, a moral crisis in Silicon Valley among some of the innovators going like, well, what have I, what have I done? You know, the, the founder of Instagram resigned from Facebook and uh, he said, you know, if things are going really well, that's not when you leave a job. And he was talking about um, how he was concerned about his legacy. He said, you know, it's nice that we have people sharing photos and this and that, but that's not enough. Um, so there, I think right now we're in this moment of awareness and self-reflection. And so then the next thing is, okay, so now that we know that we didn't do things right because we were ignorant, we were, you know, narrow-minded or whatever, you just, you know, as the saying goes, when you know better, you do better. So now we're, we're beginning to know better. So now the next step is how do we do better? So in the engineering, the Peace Engineering Conference, we will be spending time talking about what curriculum would look like. What does ethical design look like? And how do we teach that and fit it into an already crowded engineering uh, program? So there's a tension between time and understanding this as well. Um, I don't have an answer for it, but I'm working on it. How about that? OK. Thank you, very, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation. I'm wondering if you can talk about tech companies partnering with the Pentagon. So I'm thinking about the case of uh, Google most recently refusing to partner with the Pentagon on the Project Maven program. But Amazon and Google are uh, pursuing Pentagon contracts. And you know the, the Pentagon is, is the, the most violent institution on the planet, undermining peace all over the world. And I think you're right when, we, when you talk about the future is, is the future that's funded, that we want, right? And the US government is spending so much money on the military. And mm -hmm. the Pentagon is, 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 is looking at uh, technology and uh, AI for uh, future warfare. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that uh, relationship between the tech companies and the Pentagon. Well, what's really interesting right now is um, how millennials are beginning to exert their values in these companies. And you're seeing this in Uber, in Facebook, in Google, where um, recruiting is becoming a problem based on the ethical position that these companies are taking on various issues. You know, you had a number of Google employees sign a petition saying like, we don't want to participate in this. And uh, one of the dilemmas when you're dealing with platforms that are very horizontal is that you could be working on some discrete piece of code, but you don't know where it's going to end up. And so, because everything's connected to everything, uh, again, there's this awareness that we don't want to do that. There's going to be a tension between, um, uh, again, this is a tension between the market and profitability and, and employees. The, it will be interesting to see if the employees win. And the reason that they might win is because they actually have more power than they know. Because the number of people who can code, relatively speaking, is still very scarce. And so we constantly have this competition for talent in Silicon Valley. 
and companies poaching from each other. That's why the salaries uh, for programmers are so high, because there aren't, that many, there aren't that many of them. And so if Google's finding the, our position in terms of taking this, this military contract is going to affect our recruiting, they might think twice about it. So there is, there is a potential there for that. And um, certainly with the younger people that I work with, they're beginning to be aware of this. And the more that they see that technology is having a detrimental effect in society, the more they want to step away from it. So um, I think there's a the potential, again, for employees to exert more power around this. But it is, it is a conundrum. And um, even in Facebook, there is a lot of internal conflict. And in, in these companies, when I talk to people who are in HR, this is reaching a, a position that they need to do something about because the, so many employees in these tech companies are unhappy. Uh, with Uber, what was, uh, what was occurring was that a lot of uh, people were resigning because they realized that having employment at Uber was actually a black mark on their resume, right? And so people are thinking about their long-term reputations in terms of the companies that they associate with. So it's, it, it'll be interesting how, to see how this all plays out, if it actually makes a, a big difference. I do not know. Yes? Good morning. Uh, my name is Derek. Uh, I really appreciated the part of your talk when you went into, um, I'm a game designer. Yes. Looking at, yeah, that's me. Um, looking at League of Legends and mm -hmm. how these companies that already have a massive player base of people interacting with each other are looking at ways that they can promote pro-social behaviors. From uh, your position over at Stanford, have you seen any games that from the ground up are designed for promoting pro-social behaviors or peace building? Is there anything notable that you've seen? N nothing notable. I mean, there was a whole movement around serious games a few years ago, as you know, mm -hmm. but they just never scaled, right. right? And so if you really wanted to have impact, it wasn't going to happen by having 2,000 people play your game. Uh, the way you're going to have impact is having millions of people play your game. Um, that's why Chris Ben and I worked together because he spent 25 years in in the games industry, Maxis, EA, and so on. So he is, you know, for him, a success is when a million people are playing a game. Um, and so we've been trying to figure out how to use th all the methods and frameworks that allow games to scale to make them compelling, and then add the pro social on top, right? So because uh, if you say, well, that's all play a piece game, no one's going to sign up for that. Right, but you, what you can do is play around with genres of games like cooperative games, collaborative games, and so on, and uh, make that a thing, and then and then expand that out. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Thank you. This was very interesting. My name is Virginia Hoffler. I'm on the faculty here in political science, uh, and a lot of my research deals with um, the effort to get business involved in making peace, essentially. But the way in which uh, political scientists and policymakers think of that is so very different from what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at these individual level interactions like Airbnb and citizen diplomacy, which I never thought of before and I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. But most of what I find is people talking about how a corporation addresses uh, instabilities in its local community or how they might collaborate with nonprofits and policymakers in sort of global governance and global standards. So I just sort of wondered how, how your Peace Innovation Lab might think about, um, might, might sort of make those leaps between these different levels at which um, the private sector, including the tech community, sort of addresses peace in these different levels. Right. Um, you know, as I was saying, if you work with the CSR department, it doesn't go very far. You know, because uh, it's, it's kind of window dressing and, and, and one, they don't have a lot of power in the organization. Um, they don't have a lot of resources in the organization. And what tends to happen is it tends to devolve into photo ops, right? I was talking to a, a semiconductor company a couple years ago and they said they, they, they'd put like $100 million into diversity and blah, blah, blah. And I go, oh, okay, great. And we want to increase engagement, get more women and more people of color. And I go, got it. And how can we work together? And, and say, well, you know, we'd like to do some research, we'd like to, you know, develop some technologies and so on. They go, well, actually, we fund events. And I go, oh, okay. So basically, the CEO wanted photo ops that he could put in the annual, you know, meeting brochure to say, this is the good that we did in the world because look at all the smiling children, right? 
And so there's this big disconnect between having the appearance of doing something and actually doing something. Because as we all know, there are practitioners in the room, when you get in the ground, this is hard. And there's a lot of failure. Um, and so for companies, it's not in their sweet spot. It's not in their competency to, to do that. But what they can do is say, how do we, you know, this is again around difference boundaries. When, when I look at companies, they say, OK, look, if we want to, let's talk about positive peace in a different way. Let's talk about how do you create an extraordinary customer experience. And I do a lot of executive education around this where corporate CXOs say, I want to create an extraordinary customer experience and I want to do it digital and blah, 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 blah. And I go, great. So who are you reaching out to? What, what are the demographics? Who are these people? Who, who's missing in terms of your customer base? Are you only, um, is it just you know, this one demographic and you've left out people of color? It's just men, but you left out women? Because you know what? If you could create a product that really spoke to women, boom, you've just doubled the size of your market. And they go, oh, yeah, I like that. So part of it is um, relanguaging and translating what we do into the language that business understands. So they go, yes, I want more customers. Great. How do I get loyal customers? You know, why do you prefer this coffee shop over that one? I mean, the coffee's identical, to be honest, right? Steamed milk, coffee, da da da. Why do you go here versus there? Why do you habituate? That's why um, the behavior design comes in. How do I make my product or service a habit for my customer? The way I do that is I make them feel good. I design for emotion. Right? So why do I go to my favorite coffee shop? Because the barista already knows my order when I'm in line. Because he remembers me. Right? That's why I go there. It's not about the mechanics. It's about how you make people feel. And that is positive engagement. And that creates customer loyalty. You know, if we were going to brainstorm all the different ways we would need to get someone off a plane because it got overbooked, how would we persuade someone to get off of a plane? It would probably not be by dragging someone out by their ankles and breaking their teeth. It probably would not come in the top 100 ideas. It probably would not come up in the top 500 ideas. And yet, we see airlines do that all the time. Sorry, United. You know. And so if we were thinking about how do we create an extraordinary customer experience, how do we treat people with respect, with regard, with kindness, with empathy, that would manifest itself in a different way. And of course, employees can't give what they don't get. If employees don't receive respect, empathy, trust, they don't exercise that muscle, then when they're presented in a weird situation, they don't have that accessible, right? So it's all connected. And so, that, so when I talk to companies, I talk to them in this language. And then they go, oh, I get it now. I get it. It really, it does relate to uh, employee engagement. It does uh, relate to uh, retaining and getting more customers. It's all good. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I, I think I see a, a, like an intrinsic bias on this technology data querying. Uh, I just arrived from Colombia. I'm starting like grad school here. Uh, and they're actually like just a quarter of the population actually are using all these platforms. Um, it's very interesting when you go like very far away from a big city, people would have smartphones in the middle of nowhere and connection, but they will just use WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. That's basically, they are, they are like closer in this cultural bubble in which they just use WhatsApp. And some people are very intelligent and get to use WhatsApp for Everything basically like for what you use Facebook for, what you use uh, Airbnb for, they do all that just with WhatsApp. So, uh, do you take into account th this bias, like in, in probably in third world countries, in which like all this data is not like the same? Oh, you mean in terms of people's preference to use WhatsApp versus other platforms? Yeah, well, probably in 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 many countries, other platforms are not going to be used at all. Right, right. Or, or I don't know, like for example, in China or Russia, they don't use Facebook as much as their own platform. Correct. Things like Correct. that. Correct. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, different communities use different platforms, but the ability to to see what the behavior is should be the same in all of them, 
right? Because all of these platforms are looking to increase engagement. They're all looking at these metrics of how often, you know, how much time do people spend on the platform, what are they doing, and so on. Um, so that's just sort of inherent in the design of all these platforms. Yes. Good morning. Uh, great presentation. I, I hope we can uh, access your slides uh, sometimes in the future. Uh, two questions to ponder about. One is, um, especially with tech, um, I know a lot of the VCs have been funding companies that are looking at platforms mm -hmm. and uh, looking to dominate their sectors. Um, have you thought through in terms of, okay, if you support these, com uh, these companies, how will their dominance affect uh, people uh, later on? For example, you know, Facebook is dominating the whole social media uh, advertising, Google on the search advertising, and it's very hard for young companies to come there. So by supporting these companies through your peace building efforts, how will you prevent other companies from you know, engaging with you guys? You know, it's interesting. I, I look at, I've, I've been in the, the technology, be, I've been in Silicon Valley since 1979, so it's been a long time. And I've seen technology come and technology go. And, and when people ask me about Facebook, and I have an 18-year-old son, I go, I imagine a day, you know, in the next decade or two, well, he'll be talking to his children and say, you know, when I was a teenager, there was this platform, and it was called Facebook. And people used to do, you know, they used to share and comment and like and give smiley faces and all this on this platform. And his kids are going to say, really, Dad? And they go, yeah, it was, a, it was a really big thing in the 2000s and the 2010s. You know, it's sort of like nobody talks about Prodigy anymore or AOL. These things come and go. Um, I don't know, you know, IBM is probably the oldest technology company around, right? Um, I don't know what the lifespan of these companies is. And certainly what we're seeing in terms of the technology preferences of middle schoolers and high schoolers is they don't spend any time on Facebook, right? right? It's like, no, Facebook is what mom is on. <laughs> I'm not on Facebook, you know? And, and my 18-year-old, although he has a Facebook account, he is never on Facebook. What he is on is Snapchat, right? Yeah. And so Snapchat is the thing. And there's some, there's some nine-year-old who's gonna come up and say, Snapchat? That's what my older brother uses. I don't use Snapchat, I use something else. And so there is this um, association right now with the technology and the cohort. And so it'll be interesting to see if these things just die out or if they plateau, right? Will Facebook be ha become the Yahoo of, of, of the 2020s, right? I don't know. Um, so I don't think that um, us working with these larger platforms is going to uh, prevent us working with younger ones. In fact, if anything, we get more engagement with startups where they actually do want to be able to do this right. They've seen the mistakes and the damage that platforms like Facebook and Twitter have caused, and they don't want to do that. So we actually get more engagement with 20, 22-year-olds on how to, how to do it better. Any other questions? Se yes. Second question? Yes. Um, I'm a, a first-year PhD student at the School of Education and my focus is on STEM education for girls, mm -hmm. um, especially intersection of STEM with uh, more um, developing uh, solutions for, for the good or people at the bottom of the pyramid. And I was wondering whether you have any focus on, uh, or more focus on developing more from a gender lens, uh, developing um, girls and women to do this versus focusing on men or just tech in general. Well, interesting you should say that my co-director was in Helsinki this weekend um, at the Dash Hackathon at Alta University, and his track was on uh, uh, gender and tech. And he said it was, um, you know, they had more women. It was one, it was oversubscribed, and it was overwhelmingly female. And the way he set up the hackathon was it for it to be cooperative and collaborative rather than competitive. And all the other tracks were looking and going like, what's going on over there? They, they, they seem to be having a great time. I think that, um, and I, I, I went into engineering because my dad read an article in the Reader's Digest in 1970, something, that the future was in engineering. So he said, Miha, you're going to be an engineer. It's like, oh, okay, dang. You know, <laughs> I didn't have a choice in the matter, right? I, I didn't think I had a choice in the matter. And then when I showed up to Stanford, I go, I want to be an engineer. They said, what kind? And I go, what do you mean, what kind? Because I had never actually met an engineer. They go, well, there's chemical engineering and electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. And, air, and I'm like, well, which one pays the most? And so I made my decision in engineering based on what the, the, the starting salary was. So I was a petroleum engineer. Imagine that. Yes, I worked for Getty. No, I did not enjoy it. No, I did not stay. I think that um, it would be great to have more diversity in STEM. Absolutely. Mexican-American, female, short, dark, 
You know, I'm, I'm an engineer, yay. However, what we actually need more of are non-engineers in engineering companies. That's what we need. We need philosophers, we need ethicists, we need, we need social scientists, we need psychologists. I would love, my dream major, if I could you know, engineer this at Stanford or if I could make this happen, is to have the African American studies students be in computer science classes is to have the gender studies students be in design school classes, to have um, you know, people who are focused on political science be in sy symbolic systems classes, because those voices and those points of view are missing in the discussion. I don't need more people trained as engineers. We got plenty of engineers. We don't have enough people who can bridge the gap with engineers and help them understand what they don't know, what they're missing. You know, if there had been political scientist PhDs who were in venture capital on Sand Hill Road, they might have said, you know what, this thing about, um, you know, these platforms and, and all this, and this fake news and, and so on, they might have gotten a clue earlier, and they might have said, we need to do something about it. But because they didn't understand the political, economic, and societal ramifications of these technologies, they did nothing because they didn't know. They weren't trained to look at the world in that way. So this is my, my soapbox, this is my dagger in the ground. We need more humanities people in tech if we're, gonna, uh, if we're gonna broaden this up and really fix it. I think I should end right there. <laughs> thank you. Please thank Margarita for her beautiful presentation and we appreciate your being here today and thank, thank you. you very much.